I'm Dr. Barbara Walters, and I would like to welcome you to this brief podcast on Max Weber, the Protestant ethic, and the spirit of capitalism. This represents one of the most important, and certainly the best known, of Max Weber's many, many books. Here, Weber explores the transformative psychology and inner bonding, the elective affinity, connecting the Protestant ethic and the spirit behind the emergence of market economies. This is a non-deterministic explanation and an interpretive study that exemplifies Weber's use of ideal types and his comparative historical method. Max Weber, unlike Karl Marx, believed that capitalism was a superior social system for enhancing human freedom and economic productivity. The key question he raises in the Protestant ethic and spirit of capitalism is why did capitalism emerge in Western Europe as opposed to somewhere else? This launched a set of unfinished comparative studies on religions in China, India, Islam, and Judaism. And so we begin our exploration of the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. The next set of slides, and there are four of them, depict various artistic renditions of belief systems in our final end as something that extends beyond our natural end. So the first is Michelangelo. Next, Jacob de Bacher. Third, a painting, a later painting by Vermeer in which the latter, the Bacher painting, appears in the background. And finally, the body of the dead Christ in the tomb, which is a contemporary of slightly earlier than Michelangelo, but a different view of the Christian destiny than that depicted by Michelangelo. This view is described by both Tolstoy and Christova, Julia Christova. It's a rendition of the moment of rigor mortis in which there is no hope of resurrection. This allows perhaps a deeper understanding of what Weber meant by radical doubt. Thus, during this early period, very early period, uh, in which market economies began to emerge, there were significant differences between the Protestant ethic and the Catholic ethic. This is a rather simplistic comparison, but God and the Protestant vision was fully transcendent, creating an unbridgeable chasm between humans and God. Especially Calvinism had as part of its theology the idea of double predestination, that is, that a person is born and defined at the moment of birth in terms of both his natural end and his final end. The the big transformation was an ethos of world mastery orienting lives to work and material success in this world. That was expressed or articulated through a kind of ascetic lifestyle and the idea of a vocational calling to a mundane task in this world. By contrast, Catholicism held that God was imminent, that he could be discerned and approached through some form of, in quotes, good works. The vocation or calling 
was a way of living one's entire life in relationship to this understanding of the natural end and the final end. The anxiety evoked by the uncertainty manifest in the Protestant theology was here alleviated by the sacrament of confession. Perhaps equally important, in Catholicism there was a rather neg negative image of merchants and a prohib prohibition against usury. The overall view presented here owes much to Stephen Kahlberg's introduction in his translation of The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism. Weber saw an inner affinity between the ethical beliefs and ascetic practices of the Puritans, the Protestants, and the ethos or economic rationalism of capitalism, which propelled its emergence and growth. The religion and economy forged a voluntary bond among practitioners based on internal affinities between these two otherwise independent spirits or belief systems. Weber's concept, his genius on this, provides a perfect example of abduction per the work on theorizing by Charles Pierce. There are three key ideas to the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. First, the Protestant ethic involves an internal rationalization, methodical orderliness in life. It is a disposition that becomes second nature. The internal organization of life had earlier characterized the life of medieval monks who lived in monasteries and were oriented toward otherworldly outcomes. The ascetic Protestants, by contrast, adopted the same internal rationalization which was now lived in the world. The radical doubt and the theological idea of predestination, work, wealth, profit, and competition were thereby endowed with providential significance. They became signs of election. Capitalism and the economic ethos emerged in tandem and parallel to the Protestant ethic. Here, there was an economic rationalization and cultivation of habits, habits of rational conduct. It became a duty, a vocation, or a calling to increase wealth. A transformation of the work ethic to value labor, whereas in the prior historical period, labor was viewed with disdain on the part of an aristocracy. By the Protestants, or as part of the capitalist movement or market movement, now work had value in and of itself. There was an affirmation of competition and the pursuit of individual gain. This is very different than Werner Sombart, uh, who had a rather anti-Semitic tract and speculative capitalism. Here, there is a systematic organization of labor and the workplace in general. In summary, there are several elements. First, the Protestant ethic involves the methodical, rational organization of life and internal systematization in response to the radical anxiety provoked by the lack of knowledge and lack of certainty about one's final end. The spirit of capitalism likewise involves a transformation of the work ethic and work organization, whereas medieval monks or otherworldly ascetics who lived outside the world in monastic settings, ascetic Puritans engaged in earning a living in the world. Their material success in the face of the radical doubt and radical anxiety and 
the double predestination, became a sign of their membership in the elect, that is, the elect and the final end. Thus, work itself became a calling or vocation. Work, wealth, profit, competition, which were previously mundane and looked down upon by the aristocracy of the medieval period, were now sanctified and glorified as signs of membership in the elect. Elective affinity, perhaps the most difficult of Weber's concepts, means an internal, voluntary bonding of ideas through the carrier strata.